Hey everyone, this is Dr. Mark Hahn, and we are going over chapter 18 in your book on blood. So the circulatory system is divided into the cardiovascular system as well as the lymphatic system. Blood has many important functions. Primarily it uh, has the ability to transport um, things throughout the circulatory system. So blood is a transport mechanism for nutrients, for signaling molecules. We talked about hormones um, last unit. Uh, hormones travel uh, through blood within the circulatory system to um, give signals to either affect our organs or affect our cells. Uh, blood is also a transport mechanism for respiratory gases, especially our oxygen and the waste products of metabolism, which is carbon dioxide. And like I said, a mechanism, a transport mechanism for waste products. The circulation of blood is powered by the pumping action of the heart, which we talked about um, in the chapter on the heart. Oxygen and nutrients will diffuse across capillary walls to body tissues. Uh, circulation of the blood allows for the transportation of hormones from endocrine glands to their effector cells or organs. Also helps convey the cells of the immune system that help us fight off infection. Uh, circulation of blood is also important for regulating our body temperature and maintaining homeostasis. The normal amount of blood volume uh, depends if you're male or female. In males, it's about 5 to 6 liters of blood. In females, about 4 to 5 liters of blood. And then we know that blood has both cellular and liquid components. Blood is a specialized connective tissue that we talked about in the first unit. Again, it's made up of blood cells and the different types of blood cells, and these are the formed elements, as well as plasma, which is the non-living fluid matrix uh, liquid portion of blood. So going over the different components of blood, we do different measurements with blood. For example, we take a hematocrit measurement. Hematocrit measurement is the measure of percentage of red blood cells or erythrocytes. Normal hematocrit is about 47% uh, in males and 42% in females. Why do we measure hematocrit? Hematocrit is important because we want to kind of have an idea as to the um, oxygen transportation uh, ability of our blood, whether or not um, our, our red blood cells are available to transport oxygen. Also, within blood, when we do a centrifuge, um, meaning we take a, a vial of blood and place it in a centrifuge and spin it so that it breaks it down into the different components based on weight. There is a layer within that uh, centrifuge tube called the Buffy coat, and the Buffy coat is a portion of blood composed of leukocytes as well as platelets, leukocytes again being um, our white blood cells. Um, and the Buffy coat is present at the junction of plasma and red blood cells. So when you centrifuge a tube or vial of blood, the red blood cells will be the heavier cells, so they will be at the bottom of the centrifuge tube, plasma being uh, at the top part of the tube, and a small buffy coat layer um, between plasma and red blood cells. And we can actually see it in this vial here. So with, we withdraw um, and do a blood draw uh, from a patient and place that blood in a tube. Hopefully the tube will have um, been layered with a, a type of uh, uh, some sort of um, layer that prevents the blood from clotting. We will then place this tube into a centrifuge where it will spin for a few minutes and then separate the components of whole blood um, into the different cells based on weight. And we can see that uh, the formed layer, layer elements are separated from the plasma, so the erythrocytes make up 45% of the whole blood and is the most dense component. That's why they are at the bottom of this centrifuge tube. We then have this thin layer called the Buffy coat, and that is made up of our leukocytes or white blood cells as well as platelets and then uh, so about less than one percent of whole blood and then uh, about 55 percent of whole blood is made up 
of plasma, which is that non-living fluid matrix component uh, of blood. So again, first we're going to talk about blood plasma. It's a straw-colored, sticky fluid portion of blood, non-living fluid matrix made up of approximately 90% water, contains over 100 kinds of molecules, important ions such as sodium and chloride, uh, nutrients such as sugars, amino acids, as well as lipids, can also contain wastes such as carbon dioxide, urea, and ammonia, and of course, uh, blood proteins. Now there are three main proteins contained within blood plasma. We have albumin. Albumin is an important protein because it prevents water from diffusing out of blood vessels. Uh, globulins. Globulins are proteins that include antibodies and blood proteins that transport lipids, iron, and copper. And we have fibrinogen. Fibrinogen is one of the molecules involved in chemical reactions for blood clotting. So getting into our formed elements or blood cells, we have our erythrocytes, also known as the red blood cells, leukocytes, also known as the white blood cells, as well as platelets. And some of these cells are named based on how they are stained. Um, we do use different stains for uh, staining blood cells. An acidic dye or acin will appear pink. A basic dye, methylene blue, stains blue and purple. So this next slide shows you a slide of the different formed elements or blood cells. We can see the pink staining erythrocytes or red blood cells. We know it makes up about 45% of whole blood. So we can see it makes up the majority of the cells on this slide. Then we see the different white blood cells. Um, the most numerous being the neutrophils. Neutrophils here, we can see they're darkly staining nuclei, multi-lobed. Uh, we can see granules within their cytoplasm. When we talk about the white blo blood cells, we'll talk about uh, the differences between granulocytes versus agranulocytes. Other white blood cells we can see include uh, lymphocytes. They look like a fried egg with this large yolk and a very small rim of cytoplasm. We then have the very large monocytes. Uh, you can see that they are very large cells and they have a kidney bean shaped nucleus. Um, and then we have our eosinophils with the very dark red or dark pink staining granules within their cytoplasm uh, as well as a bilobed nucleus. And not seen or represented on this slide are the basophils because basophils are very rare. They look like chocolate chip cookies. And then we see these little dots between the erythrocytes. Those are the platelets. First, we're going to talk about erythrocytes. We know that erythrocytes are oxygen transporting cells about 7.5 microns in diameter, roughly um, a little bit smaller than the diameter of a capillary. And we talked about the capillaries and how the smaller capillaries can allow for transport of erythrocytes um, within a single line or single file. So capillary of a di uh, diameter of a capillary is about 8 to 10 um, microns or micrometers. Um, most numerous of the formed elements uh, with are the erythrocytes and females. Uh, females can have anywhere between 4.3 to 5.2 million cells per cubic millimeter. In males, about 5.2 to 5.8 million cells per cubic millimeter. Uh, erythrocytes have no organelles or nuclei. Mature erythrocytes have no organelles or nuclei. If we see erythrocytes with organelles or nuclei, these are immature erythrocytes and we call these reticulocytes. And reticulocytes usually means um, there's some sort of underlying pathology if, if there's a large amount of uh, reticulocytes present in the blood. Erythrocytes are the ideal measuring tool for estimating sizes of nearby structures. So we can kind of compare the other cells um, and their size compared to the size of erythrocytes. Erythrocytes are packed with oxygen carrying protein hemoglobin. Hemoglobin molecules will bear four oxygen molecules or will transport four ox oxygen molecules uh, per hemoglobin molecule. 
And each oxygen molecule bears an iron molecule, so iron is needed for the transport of oxygen. Uh, oxidation of iron atoms of hemoglobin molecules gives blood its red color. So the presence of oxygen um, or of iron in the presence of oxygen will cause that reddish color of the red blood cells. Now erythrocytes will pick up oxygen at the lung capillaries um, and then once it gets transported to tissues it will release the oxygen across other tissue capillaries. Um, now the structural characteristics of erythrocytes will contribute to its respiratory function. So if you ever look at a erythrocyte up close, it has a biconcave shape, um, which gives it uh, 30 times more surface area to allow for the transport of oxygen. Erythrocytes are made up of 97% hemoglobin. They lack a mitochondria because they do not consume oxygen they pick up, which makes it a very efficient transport mechanism. So they don't consume that oxygen that they need to deliver to the tissues. They just transport it. That's all they do. And here we see that biconcave shape of the erythrocyte. From a side view, we can see how it is cut and then from a top view we can see that in the middle there's a little bit uh, of an indentation on one side um, and then uh, the size of the erythrocyte um, from this view from this top view is about 7.5 micrometers and from a side view it's about 2.5 moving on to leukocytes leukocytes are also known as white blood cells the amount of leukocytes in, um, in blood is about 4,800 to 11,000 per cells per cubic millimeter. Leukocytes are important because they protect the body from infectious microorganisms. Um, they can function outside the bloodstream in loose connective tissue. They have a specific characteristic called diapedesis. A diapedesis is when uh, the circulating leukocytes leave the capillaries by kind of squeezing through the fenestrations or the spaces um, within the capillary wall. Uh, leukocytes originate in bone marrow and um, they will uh, then circulate throughout the, uh, throughout the body in the circulatory system. We have two types of leukocytes. We have granulocytes and agranulocytes. Granulocytes have granules. You can see specific granules uh, that are stained within the cytoplasm. A means without, so agranulocytes do not have granules within their cytoplasm. And we can also uh, memorize, you guys can memorize the amount or how, um, how much how many cells there are or how numerous the cells are based on this monic never let monkeys eat bananas so n stands for neutrophils neutrophils are the most numerous of all the leukocytes then comes l lymphocytes m uh, stands for uh, monocytes e stands for eosinophils and b uh, stands for basophils which are the least numerous of all the leukocytes so never let monkeys eat bananas a really good mnemonic especially if for example you are working in a lab and you look at a patient's uh, cell differentiation or, or said cell blood count. Um, you can see that if one cell is more numerous than the other when it should be, it could possibly indicate some sort of underlying disease or underlying pathology. So here we see um, this isn't drawn to scale, but we can see that leukocytes making up that buffy coat between um, uh, platelets as well as plasma and then erythrocytes being the more dense. If we break down leukocytes, we do a differential WBC count of all the 4,800 to roughly 10,800 cells per uh, microliter. We can see that the neutrophils are the most numerous, making up about 50 to 70 percent of all leukocytes. Next would come the lymphocytes. Here we see um, this space making up or representing lymphocytes, about 25 to 45 percent. And then M stands for 
uh, monocytes make up about 3 to 8 percent of all leukocytes and then eosinophils about 2 to 4 percent and then the most um, rare or the least numerous of the leukocytes are the basophils making about 0.5 to 1 percent of all leukocytes. So first we're going to talk about granulocytes. The first granulocyte we'll talk about is the neutrophil. Neutrophils are the most numerous white blood cell. The granules within the cytoplasm of the neutrophils pick up the acidic and basic stains. Nucleus usually has two to six lobes, so it's multi-lobe. We talked about how it kind of looks like a weird sausage. Neutrophils are attracted by bacterial products, and they are the first responders. So they are the first in line of defense in the inflammatory response. So they will phagocytize and destroy bacteria, kind of like Pac-Man cells. They'll engulf bacteria and destroy this bacteria. They will release enzymes within their cytoplasm into the extracellular matrix of infective tissue um, to destroy uh, or to break down any um, foreign invaders that might be harming our body. So here we see a picture of a typical neutrophil. We can see that multi-lobed nucleus, darkly staining purple, kind of looks like weird sausages. We see some pinkish granules within the cytoplasm, um, so pale red and blue cytoplasmic granules. Another type of granulocyte is an eosinophil. Eosinophils represent about 1 to 4% of all white blood cells. If I think of eosinophils, I think of parasitic infections. They are very important in um, parasitic infection, infections. So, we, And another thing I, that I think about when I think about eosinophils are red granules. So granules within the cytoplasm of eosinophils are large and they stain very uh, red. So these granules actually contain enzymes that are active during allergic reactions and parasitic infections. They play a role in ending allergic reactions by phagocytizing allergens, so engulfing those allergens that are causing these allergic reactions. They will uh, secrete enzymes that will degrade histamines. So histamines are released by our body to cause that inflammatory reaction. So um, uh, eosinophils will actually secrete enzymes that will degrade these histamines to kind of decrease the inflammatory response. Here we see a typical eosinophil with those uh, typical red staining granules within the cytoplasm. Um, eosinophils have a bilobed nucleus. Um, and again, that very red um, dark staining granules within the cytoplasm. The third type of granulocyte are basophils. Basophils are very rare, make up about 0.5% of all leukocytes. The nucleus usually has two lobes. However, because the granules within the cytoplasm stain such dark purple um, uh, or blue, you can't really see the bilobed nucleus, but basophils do have um, usually a bilobed nucleus. Basophils um, have granules within their cytoplasm that secrete histamines. They function in uh, inflammation mediation and are similar in function to mast cells. And they will also direct later stages of inflammation and allergies as well as parasitic infections. Now when I think of a basophil, I think of a chocolate chip cookie cell. So here you can see it kind of looks like a chocolate chip cookie. So the dark staining granules within the cytoplasm kind of um, hide the bilobed nucleus, but the nucleus of a basophil is bilobed, so meaning it has two lobes to its nucleus. Again, you'll see those purplish black cytoplasmic granules. For me, it looks like a chocolate chip cookie, so I call it a chocolate chip cookie cell. Again, these are very rare cells, make up about 0.5% of all leukocytes, and I usually challenge my students to try to find one under a blood smear because they are very rare. If there is a large amount of basophils. Uh, we call it basophilia, and usually it's indicative of some sort of underlying pathology such as CML. Next we're going to talk about A granulocytes. So A means without. These are uh, leukocytes that do not have um, that do not have granules within their cytoplasm. The first uh, A granulocyte we're going to talk about are lymphocytes. Lymphocytes uh, are the second most numerous of all leukocytes, make up about 
20 to 45% of white blood cells. These are the most important cells of the immune system. We talked about the immune system a few chapters ago and uh, the lymphocytes. We talk about T lymphocytes and B lymphocytes and how these cells help us fight off infections, fight off uh, infections by viruses, bacteria, and any foreign invaders. Now with lymphocytes, their nuclei stains a dark purple, kind of looks like a large egg yolk. So the appearance I like to kind of uh, identify with lymphocytes is a fried egg. So you have this large uh, egg yolk and then the small rim of cytoplasm. So again, lymphocytes are effective in fighting infectious organisms and act against a specific foreign molecule, also known as an antigen. So they will fight against a specific antigen or a specific uh, foreign um, organism. So here we see a lymphocyte, again, that fried egg appearance with this large nucleus that looks like the a very large egg yolk and a very small rim of cytoplasm. So large spherical nucleus, thin rim of blue, of pale blue cytoplasm. Now you can't really tell which one's a T lymphocyte or a B lymphocyte, but know that these are lymphocytes. And again, they are agranulocytes, meaning they do not have granules within the cytoplasm. So there are two main classes of lymphocytes that we talked about. We have our T lymphocytes or T cells that will attack foreign cells directly. And then we have our B lymphocytes or B cells that will multiply to become plasma cells, which will eventually secrete antibodies. The next type of A granulocyte is a monocyte. A monocyte is composed of four to 8% of all white blood cells. It is the largest of all leukocytes. These are very big cells. The nucleus uh, is kidney shaped and monocytes will eventually transform into macrophages, which are phagocytic cells. Um, and depending on what type of tissue they go into, they do become specific types of macrophages. Here we see a very large monocyte. Again, it is an agranulocyte, meaning there are no granules within their cytoplasm. We see that kidney-shaped nucleus and very abundant pale blue cytoplasm. The next type of cell is a platelet. Platelets are basically cell fragments that break off from larger cells called megakaryocytes. Platelets are very essential in uh, clot formation of blood to prevent bleeding out. So we do need platelets. Platelets are very important. There are specific viruses that actually attack and decrease the number of platelets, especially in the Philippines. So we have dengue fever. Dengue fever is a type of virus that is transmitted from the bite of an infected mosquito. And it usually... Um, especially in the very old or very young, has very devastating um, effects. Um, I've had one patient who, when I monitored this patient, their platelet went down to five. Now, mind you, normal platelet count is anywhere from 250,000 to 500,000. The patient I had went down to five. So that's how uh, dramatic an effect dengue fever can have. Uh, on platelets and usually pa patients that have platelets of that are very low we are very concerned that they might bleed out because they don't have that uh, clotting function uh, within the blood because of the decrease in the amount of platelets. So this next table in your book, table 18.1, is a nice summary of the different formed elements of the blood. It will give you the cell type, um, give you a picture uh, of what it looks like in a description, as well as the number of cells uh, per cubic mic uh, millimeter of blood. Um, it's important to know, you know, uh, the numbers, especially the most numerous versus the least numerous. And again, use that mnemonic, never let monkeys eat bananas. Um, an important note for erythrocytes is their lifespan. The lifespan of most erythrocytes is anywhere between 100 to 120 days. So that's about four months. And it's important because clinically speaking, we use um, a measurement called HbA1c. HbA1c stands for uh, glycosylated hemoglobin. Um, this is an important measurement, especially for, for diabetic patients. 
Uh, we know that red blood cells live up to four months, so we can get an idea of how well a diabetic patient is doing with their medication and lifestyle changes in the span of four months. Because we know that this glycosylated hemoglobin or this hemoglobin that um, kind of uh, attaches to a sugar component so we can monitor blood sugar in that diabetic patient, we can monitor their... Uh, whether or not they've been compliant with their medication, compliant with their lifestyle changes in the span of four months. If, for example, we get you know, overnight blood sugar and it's within normal, however, their HbA1c is very elevated and the patient is telling you, oh yeah, I've been, I've been following you know, my directions, such as taking my, my medications, uh, exercising, eating less carbs, eating less sugar. Uh, their fasting blood sugar might tell you that, but their HbA1c might give you a different picture and you might want to ask them to uh, kind of uh, expand on how they've been uh, or maybe change their story because HbA1c does not lie. Um, so another thing to note for leukocytes, make sure you're uh, comfortable with you know knowing which are the most numerous to which are the least numerous this also does a really great job in uh, giving good descriptions that we've gone over including diameter and size as well as functions so make sure you're comfortable knowing the functions of the different types um, of cells um, that make up the formed elements of blood and here we see our granulocytes and agranulocytes. So our granulocytes will be on one part of this table and agranulocytes on another. And then we see platelets. So normal platelets anywhere between 150,000 to 500,000 according to this table. So make sure if you're going to study anything, definitely study this table in your book. How is blood formed? Hematopoiesis is the term... Um, that describes the process by which blood cells are formed in red marrow, red marrow located within our bones. About 100 billion new blood cells are formed each day. So bone marrow is located within all bones, and bone marrow is the site of hematopoiesis, or blood cell formation. Red marrow actively generates new blood cells. It will contain immature erythrocytes, which will eventually mature to become uh, mature erythrocytes, and circulate in the blood. In adults, red marrow is located between the trabeculae of spongy bone of the axial skeleton in the different girdles and in the proximal epiphyses of the humerus and femur. So these are all important sites for red marrow uh, where hematopoiesis occurs. Yellow marrow is dormant and contains many fat cells, and yellow marrow is located in the long bones of adults. Now we know that reticular connective tissue is the tissue framework of bone marrow. We have our fibroblasts, um, fibroblasts that cover and secrete the fiber network, um, and these fibroblasts are reticular cells. Uh, blood, blood sinusoids run throughout the reticular tissue, and we've seen uh, images of this in our slides in histology. Mature blood cells will enter the bloodstream through the endothelial cells of these sinusoids. Now, the reticular tissue of bone marrow contains macrophages that extend pseudopods uh, to capture antigens. So pseudopods, think of kind of um, foot processes that can uh, reach out and capture antigens. Now, some cells of the reticular network are mesenchymal stem cells that give rise to fat cells, osteoblasts, those immature bone cells, chondrocytes, cells of the cartilage, fibroblasts, and muscle cells. So here we see some uh, locations of red bone marrow in the spongy bone. Here we have an example of the spongy bone within the vertebrae. Uh, we can see a slide of red bone marrow. We have adipocytes or our fat cells. There's some immature blood cells. Uh, we have our uh, blood sinusoids and we can see the trabeculae of spongy bone. And then if we look up uh, uh, increase um, the uh, the image the um, if we increase it so we can see the uh, cells a little bit 
uh, larger, we can see reticular cells, immature blood cells. Uh, we can see some erythrocytes, and we can see some reticular fibers. So all blood cells will originate in bone marrow, and all will originate from one cell type. So we have hematopoietic blood stem cells, also known as the pluripotential hematopoietic stem cells. We have lymphoid stem cells that give rise to lymphocytes, and myeloid stem cells that will give rise to all other blood cells. So lymphoid stem cells specifically give rise to lymphocytes. With regards to erythrocytes, um, they come from com um, committed cells, which are the pro-erythroblasts that will remain in the reticulocyte stage uh, for one to two days in circulation. So immature erythrocytes are known as reticulocytes, and the reticulocyte stage lasts for about one to two days in circulation. Um, and they make up about one to two percent of all erythrocytes. For leukocytes, they come from uh, the committed cell type in each granulocyte line, which are myoblasts, and then monoblasts will enlarge and form monocytes. Megakaryoblasts will then differentiate into megakaryocytes, and these are the cells um, where uh, pieces of these cells will break apart into our platelets. So this next slide actually shows you the different um, differentiation or the different stages of differentiation of blood cells in the bone marrow. So first we have our hematopoietic stem cell. Um, from there it can either be a myeloid stem cell or a lymphoid stem cell. And here we see the lympho uh, the myeloid stem cell becoming uh, the different immature cells that will eventually become um, most of the formed elements. And then the lymphoid stem cell, of course, becoming the uh, different lymphocytes, either the B lymphocyte or T lymphocyte. So starting with the myeloid stem cell, we have a proerythroblast, and it goes through the different stages um, of differentiation and maturation, which will then eventually become, uh, from a reticulocyte, a erythrocyte or red blood cell. Uh, here are the myoblasts. The myoblasts will become... Uh, the different granular leukocytes. So we see, um, you know, uh, the pro-sites, uh, pro-myelocytes, which will eventually become the eosinophils, basophils, and neutrophils. Here we see a monoblast, which will eventually become a monocyte, and then depending on what tissue this uh, monocyte will travel to, will become a specific type of macrophage. And here we see a, a megakaryoblast, which will eventually mature to become a uh, megakaryocyte. And then from the megakaryocyte, we can see that platelets will break off this cell to form their blood clotting functions. So the majority of the cells coming from the myeloid stem cell, and then the lymphocytes coming from that lymphoid stem cell. So B lymphocyte will eventually become plasma cells that secrete antibodies, and we have T lymphocytes uh, that become an effector T cell that will directly attack any uh, foreign antigen. So we have different disorders of the blood uh, due to disorders of the different cells. For example, disorders of erythrocytes will have uh, polycythemia. Poly means many. So polycythemia is an abnormal excess of erythrocytes, and this will have an effect by increasing the viscosity of the blood. Viscosity, think stickiness or thickness. Think of it as um, the oil in your car. Normal oil in the car is, is pretty, you know, um, slick, not as sticky, but if you have any gunk or buildup in the, uh, in the oil, this can cause a slowing of function. So if we have an excess of erythrocytes, this can kind of cause the blood to become sluggish, um, which would also kind of wreak havoc on the cardiovascular system. Um, could cause clots could, you know, cause all sorts of damage. Anemia. Anemia occurs when the erythrocyte levels or hemoglobin concentrations are low. This, um, 
causes an effect of a decrease in the amount of oxygen that will be transported to the tissues. So anemia, uh, usually due to a decrease in the number of erythrocytes or the decrease in the um, oxygen carrying capacity of the red blood cells due to a decrease in hemoglobin concentrations. Another disorder described in your book of erythrocytes is sickle cell disease. Sickle cell disease is, is an inherited uh, condition that results from a defective hemoglobin molecule. What will happen is the erythrocytes will distort into a sickle shape and um, because of this they will be uh, destroyed in the spleen or destroyed in uh, certain organs because it doesn't have um, the correct shape and this can also cause a type of anemia. Moving on to disorders of leukocytes or our white blood cells, we have leukemia which is a form of cancer and can be classified uh, according to um, the type of cell that has uh, increased within the blood. So it can be classified as lymphoblastic or myoblastic. So lymphoblastic when we have an increase um, in the number of abnormal uh, immature uh, lymphoblasts or uh, cells that will eventually become lymphocytes. Or we can have abnormal numbers of myoblasts, these types of cells that become all the other types of cells. So uh, leukemia uh, classified as either lymphoblastic or myoblastic and can also be classified as acute or chronic. We also have disorders of platelets. We have thrombocytopenia. Whenever you see the word penia, think decreased numbers. Cyto means cell. So thrombocytopenia is a decrease in the number of thrombocytes or platelets. So thrombocytopenia is abnormally low concentrations of platelets. Now throughout life, the first blood cells uh, develop with the earliest blood vessels. Mesenchyme cells will cluster into blood islands and usually late in month two of fetal development, the liver and spleen will take over blood formation. However, um, by month seven in fetal life, the bone marrow will become the major site for a hematopoiesis. And that's it for uh, chapter 18 on blood.